Welcome to the life of a Roman emperor, where the average job tenure was shorter than a decade, and the most common cause of job termination was, well, termination. Yet in the midst of this chaos, a ray of hope emerged. A period known as the Pax Romana, or Roman peace, saw a succession of five emperors who were notably different. They are known to history as the five good emperors. But how good were they? Strap in as we embark on a journey to uncover the truths and myths of these rulers. First on the list is Nerva. He was like that substitute teacher who everyone likes because he gives no homework. Nerva, a man of noble birth and a senator in his own right, found himself thrust into the role of emperor in his late sixties. Quite the late bloomer, wouldn't you agree? His reign, albeit brief spanning from September of 96 to January of 98, was marked by a significant departure from the autocratic rule that had become customary under the Flavian dynasty. Despite his relatively short tenure, Nerva managed to make some pretty impressive strides. He was a man of the people, or at least he tried to be. He implemented policies designed to ease the burden on the lower classes, including reducing oppressive taxes and initiating a program of public and private works. On top of that, he introduced a unique practice known as Alimenta, a form of welfare to assist orphans and poor children throughout Italy. It's almost like he was trying to win a popularity contest, isn't it? Well, it worked. The Senate loved him, and he was hailed as a restorer of liberty and the rule of law after the tyranny of Domitian. But not everyone was a fan. The military, for one, was less than pleased with Nerva's rule, mainly due to his lack of military background and his failure to pay the soldiers the donatives promised by his predecessor. This led to a short-lived revolt, which Nerva managed to quell, but it made his position shaky. While Nerva's reign was brief, it set the tone for a new kind of leadership in Rome. He was the first of the adoptive emperors, choosing his successor based on merit rather than bloodline. In choosing Trajan, a respected general, as his successor, Nerva effectively sidestepped the potential crisis of succession and set the stage for a period of stability and prosperity in Rome. Short and sweet, Nerva's reign was a breather for Romans, but were the others as good as him? Let's find out. Next up is Trajan, the Optimus Princeps, or the best ruler, according to the Senate. Talk about a performance appraisal. Trajan, born into a well-established family in Hispania, was a man of many talents and achievements. He was as much a military man as he was an emperor, and his reign was marked by significant military expansion. His conquests extended the Roman Empire to its greatest territorial extent, reaching as far as modern-day Iraq and Romania. The Dacian Wars, in particular, were a testament to his military prowess. By defeating the powerful Dacian Kingdom, Trajan not only secured Rome's borders, but also opened up vast wealth in the form of Dacian gold mines, boosting the empire's economy. But Trajan wasn't just a conqueror, he was also a builder and a visionary. His reign saw the construction of many iconic buildings and monuments that showcased Roman architectural ingenuity. The Forum of Trajan, with its vast marketplaces, law courts and grand basilica, was a testament to Rome's splendour and might. The Trajan's Column, a monumental triumphal column, stands tall even today, narrating the story of the Dacian Wars in its spiralling reliefs. And let's not forget the aqueducts, roads and bridges that he built, infrastructure projects that improved the lives of his subjects. But it wasn't just about military victories and infrastructure for Trajan. He was a just ruler who cared for his people. He implemented social welfare programs, providing state funding for Italian landowners in difficulties, and he ensured grain supply for the city of Rome. He was known for his public consultation and was considered a man of the people. The Senate honored him with the title Optimus Princeps, meaning the best ruler, a testament to his popularity. Under Trajan's rule, the Roman Empire flourished, reaching its zenith in terms of territorial extent, economic prosperity and cultural influence. His reign was a golden age, a period of peace and stability marked by military successes, architectural achievements and progressive social policies. He was a ruler who was as much loved by his people as he was respected by his enemies. Trajan's rule set a high bar for his successors. His military successes expanded the empire's borders and filled its coffers. 
His building projects showcase the grandeur and might of Rome. His social welfare programs and public consultation endeared him to his subjects. His reign was truly a peak for the Roman Empire in more ways than one. But every peak has a descent, and every golden age has its sunset. Trajan's death in August of 117 marked the end of an era. His adopted heir, Hadrian, took over the reins of the empire. But that's a story for another time. So, Trajan did set the bar pretty high, but let's see how the next guy did. Meet Hadrian, Rome's very own wall builder. Sorry, Trump, he beat you to it. Our third emperor on the list, Hadrian, was a bit of a departure from the norm. He wasn't interested in expanding the borders of the empire as his predecessors had done. Instead, he was quite content with what Rome already had. His motto, maintain, don't gain. One of his most enduring legacies is, of course, Hadrian's Wall. This colossal structure stretching some 73 miles across the breadth of Britain was no mere vanity project. It was a clear statement of intent, a physical manifestation of his policy of consolidation. It said, this is Rome, no further. But it wasn't just about keeping out the riffraff. The wall was also a tool for control and regulation, a way to monitor movement and trade, and to establish a clear frontier. Hadrian was a master at using architecture as a form of power and control. Beyond his monumental wall, Hadrian focused on strengthening the empire's military and administrative structures. He reformed the army, bolstering its ranks, improving training, and ensuring it was well supplied. He also took steps to stabilize the empire's finances, implementing policies that promoted economic stability and growth. One of his less popular policies, however, was his decision to withdraw from territories that Rome had previously conquered. This was seen by many as a sign of weakness, but Hadrian saw it differently. He believed that by focusing on what Rome already had, rather than what it could potentially gain, the empire would be stronger and more stable. Hadrian was also a great patron of the arts and culture. He was responsible for the construction of many beautiful buildings, including his magnificent villa at Tivoli and the Pantheon in Rome. His love of Greek culture led to a Hellenic revival in Roman architecture and arts, and his travels throughout the empire inspired a new sense of cosmopolitanism. But Hadrian's rule was not without controversy. His relationship with the Senate was fraught, and his handling of the Jewish revolt in Judea led to a brutal and bloody conflict. His personal life, too, was the subject of much gossip and speculation, particularly his relationship with a young Greek boy named Antinous. Despite these controversies, Hadrian's reign was largely successful. His policies of consolidation and strengthening rather than expansion ensured the empire's stability and prosperity. His patronage of the arts and culture left a lasting legacy, and his architectural projects, particularly Hadrian's Wall, still stand as testament to his rule. So let's raise a glass to Hadrian, the wall builder, the consolidator, the patron of arts and culture. He may not have been a conqueror, but his impact on the Roman Empire was no less significant. Hadrian was more about consolidation than conquest. But how about the next one? Now we have Antoninus Pius, who reigned for 23 years without leaving Italy once. Talk about a homebody. Antoninus Pius, the fourth of Rome's five good emperors, was a ruler who preferred to stay close to home. His reign, from 138 to 161 AD, was marked by a distinct lack of the military conquests and architectural grandeur that characterized his predecessors. But don't mistake this for inaction or negligence. Antoninus Pius was a steward of peace, a champion of legal reform, and his reign was considered nothing short of a golden age. Antoninus Pius focused on maintaining the peace rather than expanding the empire. His reign was one of the most peaceful in Roman history, with virtually no major revolts or military conflicts. This was not due to luck or complacency, but rather a testament to his diplomatic skills and prudent management of the empire's vast resources. His peaceful reign was so remarkable that it was said he had more respect for human life than any who ever wielded power. But Antoninus Pius wasn't just about peace. He was also a champion of legal reform, focusing on the improvement of Roman law to better serve its citizens. He introduced new laws to protect slaves, widows and orphans, and sought to ensure that justice was not only served, but was seen to be served. 
His commitment to justice and fairness was truly revolutionary for the time and left a lasting legacy on the Roman legal system. This era under Antoninus Pius was considered a golden age for Rome. The empire was stable, prosperous and peaceful, but it wasn't just about economics and politics. Antoninus Pius was a patron of the arts, encouraging literature, philosophy and the sciences. His reign saw a blossoming of culture that added a richness to Roman life beyond the material wealth of the empire. While Antoninus Pius may not have left his mark on the landscape with grand monuments or extended the borders of the empire with military conquests, his influence was no less significant. His reign was marked by peace, prosperity and progress. His focus on legal reform and his patronage of the arts helped shape Rome into a more just and cultured society. Antoninus Pius was the embodiment of the Roman ideal of the good emperor. He ruled with wisdom, fairness and a deep respect for human life. His peaceful reign and emphasis on justice set a high bar for his successors and left an enduring legacy on the empire. So Antoninus Pius was the chill guy of the group, but wait till you hear about the last one. And last but not least, we have Marcus Aurelius, the philosopher king. He was like the Dumbledore of Roman emperors. Now, let's delve into the reign of this fascinating emperor and his philosophical musings that have endured the test of time. Marcus Aurelius ascended the throne in 161 AD, ruling jointly with his brother Lucius Verus until the latter's untimely death eight years later. His reign was marked by military conflict, with the Parthian Empire and Germanic tribes posing significant threats to Rome. But it wasn't just external forces that Marcus had to contend with. His reign saw the outbreak of the Antonine Plague, a pandemic that wiped out millions and severely strained the empire's resources. Despite these challenges, Marcus Aurelius proved himself a capable and pragmatic leader. He was known for his stoic philosophy, which he meticulously penned down in his private journal, later published as Meditations. These writings reveal a man who sought wisdom in the face of adversity, who strived to uphold virtue and reason above all else. Marcus Aurelius's stoicism was not just confined to his writings, it was reflected in his rule. He approached the crises of his reign with a calm and level-headed demeanour, never losing sight of his duty to the Empire. He was a leader who believed in the power of rational thought and ethical conduct, values that he tried to instil in his subjects and his son, Commodus, who would succeed him. However, Marcus Aurelius's reign was not without controversy. His decision to appoint his son, Commodus, as co-emperor has been criticised by many historians. Commodus's rule was marked by extravagance and brutality, a stark contrast to his father's stoic philosophy. Marcus Aurelius was definitely a thinking man's emperor, but was he the best of the lot? Well, that's a question that continues to spark debate among historians. What we can say for certain is that Marcus Aurelius's philosophical insights and his ability to maintain a level head in times of crisis have cemented his legacy as one of Rome's most intriguing emperors. So, there you have it, the five good emperors of Rome. They were certainly a mixed bag, weren't they? Let's take a quick recap. Nerva, the first of the five, set the precedent, but it was Trajan, the Optimus Princeps, who expanded the empire to its greatest extent. Then we had Hadrian, the wall builder, who focused on consolidating Rome's borders rather than expanding them. Antoninus Pius, the peaceful emperor, maintained a two-decade-long reign of peace. And finally, the philosopher king, Marcus Aurelius, who despite facing numerous challenges, led with wisdom and stoicism. Each of these emperors left their mark on Rome in their own way, leading with a blend of diplomacy, military strategy and philosophy. And while they all had their flaws, they were considered good because of what they achieved for the empire and its people during their reigns. But here's a question for you to ponder on. If you could choose, which of these good emperors would you prefer to rule your country and why? Drop your answers in the comments below and let's get a discussion going.